could start with your full name, please. My Ernest S. Martinez. Okay. And how do you spell your, your name? My name? Yeah, first name, yes. E-R-N-E-S-T. Right. And where and when were you born? September the 25th, 1921. So how old are you today? 97. And which branch of the military did you serve with? Army. And which units did you serve with in the Army? Uh, 9th, Infantry, 9th Infantry, 2nd Division. Which company were you with? Co company A. Company A. And what was the highest rank you attained? VFC. And what was your specialty within the Army? Uh, riflemen. You're in the infantry? Yeah. And did you receive any medals for your service? Yeah, I got the Purple Heart Combat Infantry Badge, four campaigns, Purple Heart, a Silver Star, and a Bronze Star. And what years did you serve from and until? What year? Yeah, when did you join the Army and when were you discharged? Um, oh boy, I can't remember now. I was uh, discharged on May the 25th, 19. Do you remember which year? Uh, I, think, I think 45. 45? Do you remember when you went in? Oh, I can't remember that. That was during the, the, the Great Depression. Yeah. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Uh, I was drafted, but I used to hang around with a tall guy. You're going to be my buddy. So, so let's go. Fort we went to Fort Bliss. So they throw my body in and then send him home because he had flat food or something. So they left me in there. All right. So let's, um, you were born in New Mexico, you said, right? Uh-huh. And what was the town you were born in? Tula Rosa. Tula Rosa. Okay. So um, tell me what your childhood was like. My childhood? Well, I didn't have no father. And my mother died when I was probably about 14 years old. And then I had a stepfather that didn't like me. And we had no running water, no refrigeration. Uh, uh, it was a hell of a childhood. You told me earlier you didn't have any shoes either? No shoes. <laughs> they used to make me out of my my Nino, the baptizement, they, uh, whatever little uh, Farmer John's, they used to make my clothes. So you guys didn't have very much growing up then? No, no. And how many siblings did you have? Uh, no, uh, so we, I have six. One, one of them died. And you said your mother passed away when you were 14? Yeah. And my, my father, I didn't know him. He died, I guess, before I was born. So what, what happened after your mother passed away? Did, did you and your siblings all stay together? Ah, uh, we went with one. They spread us around one and I went, one went with her aunt and the other one, I don't know if they gave them to some, somebody else. And, and then I went with my grandma. Now, did you, did you have any jobs early on? Did you start working at a young age? I started, uh, what's the rules about put the uh, Social Security? I still got it, uh, I still got it on my right arm there. See? What's that? 
5253232874. That's my social security. You got it tattooed on your arm? Yeah. A, li a little town with a model teeth. Ta, 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 ta. You guys want a tattoo? What the hell is a tattoo? Uh, uh, so you, how, how much? 50 cents. So we had 50 cents, me and the other guy. So we had it tattoo there. And 50 cents was hard to, in them, in them days, 50 cents was a lot of money. If you, if you had a dime, you were rich. So why did you choose your social security number as a tattoo? Uh, just, but, but I don't know. You just didn't have you know, nothing else to, yeah. to choose? Well, that way you'll never forget it either, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> I got it in my mind. I still got my, my serial number. To, at the time, they used to use the serial number, 3821-7998. But you'll never forget that, huh? No. In case you get captured, they, they still, that's the only thing you take, rank and serial number, no more. So did you graduate from high school? No. I didn't have no damn clothes, no shoes. I only went as far as the third grade. Third grade, huh? Oh, yeah. So what did you do after after you uh, stopped school? I would find me odd jobs so I could get a dime. Or in those days, a dime was a lot of money, mm -hmm. whatever I could. And did you stay close to your siblings? And I went to. After I got out, yeah, I, but when I was in New Mexico, I went when I was, uh, used to call CC Camp, the Roosevelt food. They big pay you a dollar a day and the food, and I sort of a uniform. I stayed about uh, one year in, in that place. Mm -hmm. So do you remember uh, when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Oh yeah. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing? Uh, I, uh, I was on that CC camp. I, I think I was, uh, uh, it was Ray Dolso, that's for that CC camp. I was hitchhiking home when they attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh -huh. Do you remember how you, how you heard the news? I heard it through the uh, radio. Do you remember what you, what you thought? when you learned that, that the U.S. had been attacked? Oh, I, no, I, I just said we, we, we were going to have to go to war. So do you remember how soon after uh, you, you joined the Army? Uh, after I joined the army. Well, how soon after after Pearl Harbor was attacked did you um, did you sign up for the army? Oh, I I can't remember. was January 6, 1943. Uh -huh. I'm looking at your, your discharge papers here. Uh -huh. And it says before um, before you joined, you were a drill press operator? Yeah, drill press operator. and. Where were you uh, working and doing that? Oh, here some... Uh, some company that named Deco or something. And then I went to a, went to the VA. I, I got discharged. I'm looking for a job. They sent me to Fifth and Hill. They say you're doing uh, luggage. I go there. What are you guys doing here? Horses. They were making horse equipment. Oh yeah. 
So I learned to fix all those those machines. So I, so I was pretty good at mechanics, even though I didn't have no schooling. So I learned to fix those machines to make a police equipment, saddles or whatever they can. I used to, I used to fix those machines. Talk to me about your basic training, where you went for training. My basic? Yes. I went to Fort Bliss and from there to Camp Roberts, California, and from there to Alabama, and uh, Alabama, they were hotter, hotter than hell, mosquitoes. So another guy said, let's join the paratroopers. So we went to Fort Benning, Georgia to train. So I stayed here, uh, one year training for the paratroopers. They disqualified me for diving out of the Mack Tower. It's about that high. It's one, two, three, and you're supposed to jump, so the shoot will go that way. Because. Uh, the main one had 48 risers, they're called risers, and the, and the emergency had 14. But they said one, two, three, if the other one don't open, pull the ripcord. But I would die if they disqualify me. They said, they're gonna get between your legs, they're gonna split you open. We cannot let you go on, on the plane. But I know how to pack them and jump out of the towers. So how, uh, wow, okay, so did you volunteer for, uh, for paratroopers? Yeah. So they didn't let me go on the plane. Uh, so what was your, um, what was your decision for joining, for wanting to be a paratrooper? Well, I, I, I just wanted to join them. I know they got paid a little bit extra. Oh yeah. Was that any incentive at all? For yeah. You? Yeah. <laughs> at the time, the the private used to get paid seventy five a month. Now they get paid pretty good. Yeah. So you did. How long did you spend it in uh, Fort Benning? Uh, they they gave me a choice. You, you've done everything right, all the run push-ups. You want to stay here and work in the kitchen? No, send me to combat outfit. So they sent me to Camp Mayo Standish in Massachusetts, and then to Liverpool, England, and there was a second division, so I would join the second division there. You joined them in England? Yeah. Are there any experiences that, that stick out in your mind from your, your training stateside that you can talk about? Like what? Well, anything, anything that stands out in your memory, if, it, if there's anything significant. Uh, not much, because in England we used to be LCA, landing craft infantry, go over there to the beach and get all wet and so that was after you had already arrived in England. Yeah. You guys were uh, training to go to, to Normandy. Training for France. Had you ever left the United States before this? Nope. Had you ever been on a ship before? Yeah. I, I, there on my, my Standish, we went to Liverpool, England. Who did I get seasick? It was like a more than a hangover. How long did that journey take for you? About 10 days. I used to go in convoys because the Germans were on torpedo the boats. And were you sick the whole time? Yeah. Get up and in case of abandoned ship, ah, let me let, let, let torpedo let him torpedo up to them sake. I didn't want to go up and get my butt and have to go up on the deck way on the, the top and 
mas está uma absoluta. Not a good feeling. No. Worse than a hangover, and I know a hangover when I got out of the war, I was a real bad alcoholic. After you got out of the war, you said? Yeah. So once you arrived in, in England, what was, what was your experience there? How did it feel to be in a different country and so far away from home? Well, to me, it didn't bother me, even though I was there in, in a different country. Were you excited? Were you nervous at all? Ah, uh, you, you were there that you didn't know, because when we went to, to France, we, we thought we were going to go to Italy or something. No? No, so then you're going to hit the coast of France. That's why we start getting scared, you know, those, getting those like nets mm -hmm. and getting the landing craft and hit the beach. The water was clear to our waist and see those soldiers died there and blood all over the place. And they, they had us downhill. All the, all the bombing that they'd done to the bunkers they didn't do a damn thing because they had a very good bunkers there. And then when we got on the top there, we had Captain LaRocco. He was the first to turn chicken and run. Say that again? Uh, captain LaRocco, that was our captain. Oh, yeah? He, he took off. Where's Captain? He's running to the back. He took off. Yeah, I, I, I said, I don't blame me nobody. We, they, they had a machine gun with a crossfire and they wounded a lot of our soldiers. So he took off. You guys arrived in England in January of 44. Uh -huh. So you, you were, continued your training there um, and eventually got ready um, to help with the invasion of France. Yeah. I saw Patton there in England. Before, you, you, guys, before you guys left. Did you have any interaction with him or hear him speak at all? Or oh, he gave us a speech. When we got all the, we're not going to dig in. We're just going to keep on going. And he died in an accident someplace in, in Germany. He just wanted to plow his way through Europe. Because yeah. Eisenhower, one of the, one of the big com commanders there, him and Eisenhower and what's the mind of the English general? Mm -hmm. they, they were directing the invasion. So what do you remember from, you, you said you guys started getting a bit nervous uh, when you were, uh, you, know, climb, you said you were climbing down the rope, boarding the, the landing crafts. Yeah. Take me through that experience. What were you feeling were you seasick at that time? I was seasick and, and, and scared, and then looking at all those soldiers dead all over the place there, blood, some with no, no legs, no head, no nothing. Where, um, which beach did you, did you land at? Omaha. And you landed on which day? Uh, we were there, but we, because they were the rangers, the paratroopers that jump on, on the back. Correct. When we were first airborne, 82nd, and, and we were the infantry, but the first, the ninth, and second division. We were then, I saw those guys dead there. I said, I'm going to be one of those, I said to myself. I, I didn't think I was coming back. I used to say, my ass belongs to the Germans, and my, I hope my soul belongs to God. I'm going to die here. I cannot survive all the firing. But the good Lord saved me. Oh, they killed one next to me. I'm going to be next. Help me, God. I'm, So as you're as you're getting off the landing craft, are you are you taking on fire still? Yeah. Well, what the hell is like this in Omaha? Was like this. 
Omaha, June or June or Salt Beach. But Omaha, was, was like, they, they had good fortifications. They even had hospitals on, on the bunker. M my son went over there to eat it there. Yeah, are those bunkers still there? <laughs> yeah. They b bombard them and, but uh, they had about eight foot of steel and cement. They, uh, they had good fortifications. Well, I, I understand that uh, the bombs that were dropped and the shells that were fired overshot a lot of the bunkers because they didn't want to, to hit any, any American troops that were uh, on the beach. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, and the Brest Peninsula, it was a, a German naval base. They, about 30,000 soldiers gave up there. That, that was their, one of the submarine bases, the, the Brest Peninsula. And every day, we were going to attack at dawn and take that at, at all costs. So I was there one day, we couldn't take care of our, our, of our objective. And there was a bike and a road, and there was, we got, so I said, I'm gonna die, I'm, uh, it might as well be right now. So I got on the bike and the west of the German lines, and the Germans took off. And now it's wide open. You scared them away. And, uh, this one they gave me the Silver Star. Where was that? It was about, uh, I think of St. Lowe, around St. Lowe. That was St. Lowe. I didn't know why, when I was in the hospital in, in England, they said, you got a Silver Star, a Bronze Star, a Purple Heart. And, you know, I was sicker than hell. Right? Because I had it, uh, uh, open wound over here, and, and when the nurse uh, went to, uh, to, I got on the shower and went and, and got infected. Ooh, I was sicker than hell. Penicillin, they would drain this thing sicker there. So, I just want to rewind a little bit and kind of focus on uh, your, your arrival once you landed uh, in Normandy, you landed on the beach. Um, and you, as you mentioned, there's uh, dead, dead soldiers all around, body parts all around. Oh yeah. This is your first experience in, to any sort of oh, yeah. combat. And what are, you, what, is, what are you thinking? I mean, you can't turn back. You got nothing but, but water behind you. Uh, well, you're, you're scared. And just say, yeah, I'm going to be next. Help me, God, I'm going to be next. And the only one that can save you is the good Lord. Otherwise, you won't come out of there for, for all that firing, and that shoot at your artillery, your tanks, machine guns, motors. And how long, how long did it take you once you landed on the beach until you got, you said you got up on the bluffs? Uh... Probably about a half a day. That's when the captain ran, ran and left us alone. With. And once your captain leaves there, you, you, you confusion. We wind up over here and some of the soldiers over there, they, they re, re, regroup. And the captain, they send them to Leavenworth and give them a dishonorable discharge for running. He, he was an asshole. We, was, uh, we were training in England. Change your shoes, and it was raining like hell. You know, it was raining in England all the time, e even in France. Raining, and raining. Did you did you see any of the Germans? Oh yeah, <laughs> live ones and dead ones. I went to. Uh, well, it was a dark. Go to check the, the German lines. So I start going. That was dark, and I saw a German over there regarding the 
Handy hole, so he raises the legs through his arms. March, march. I took him back. I took him back, and they gave me a bronze star for that. The dark. When was that? Was that one of your first nights in, in, uh, in France? Uh, uh, yeah. You, you, I, I remember it was dark when they told me to go check the other front night. Go check the outpost. Go check. The outpost, I put soldiers probably from two or three blocks in case the Germans, so they let us know that they're coming to be ready. That, that, that outpost is mostly a suicide mission, the, the guys that were there. If they would have had all their Panzer tanks, they would have run us out of the beach. The invasion would have failed. So the Paris troopers uh, land on top of the German 8th Army. Mm -hmm. Did you guys end up uh, meeting up with any of the airborne divisions? Uh, the, uh, uh, the Germans? No, with the, uh, with any of the 101st or 82nd. Oh yeah, after, after we uh, took some of their land. What were those first few nights and days like for you? Well, you don't sleep much because they're firing at you. And, and every time you stop, you, may, may, you dig a little slit trench so you can lay there. It, they're in case of shrapnel, they're firing at you. He won't stop you. If he hits you, he'll blow you. You and they're sticking him and your dog that tags. So. But it's real scary. Did you lose any close friends over there? Oh, yeah. And, and then I had one of Paul Pavalka. What are we going to do? There's nothing we can do, Paul. If we're going to die, we're going to die. It's up, up men upstairs. <laughs> hey, you let us help him. And then we were attacking, and he lay down shaking like this. He got a nerve attack. Don't help him. Let that for the medics. And I gave the medics that saved me because when I got hit, I was there bleeding like hell. And then a couple of my were came and put on my leg and gave me a you got the morphine, calm, calm the pain. I gave him credit. That's the one to save my life too. That was a bit later on, though. Yeah, and they were firing a lot of artillery. You spent you spent about four months in combat. Yeah. Was that one of the the scariest moments for you? <laughs> when you got hit. Uh, yeah, because uh, you, you know, when you get hit, you you know what what can happen. So it makes it, makes it worse to go back. Because if you're not hurt back, that's sending you back to the front lines. And I used to go send me for replacements, and the guys would get out of the, there's a lot of wheat on the hedge in, in, in France. They would get a hold of the, of the wheat, and you couldn't move them out of there. They just throw it there, and it, it, you, you couldn't get them back to the front lines. And then, and then I said to myself, I don't blame them. And I don't blame the captain to run to because there, there's a lot of firing. Had you had any other close calls before you got wounded? No. No, once I got wounded, I, I was, uh, I was uh, close to Belgium, I was I wind up on a tent hospital. Good thing I took a bath there with a little water. And from there I wound up in Paris. And that's when I attacked the Battle of the Bulge. I was in Paris. But before, before you got wounded, um, had there been any other instances uh, where, you, where you had a close call where you, where you might have almost gotten hit? Well, it, 
When you're in there, there's, there's a bunch of uh, firing at you, artillery, tanks, and in those tanks, when they fire a point blank, ooh, they make a lot of noise and go, boom. But the only one that can save you is the good Lord. And, and, and all those machine guns, artillery, motor shells, the 50s and 60s and all, a lot of fire. You, you gotta be real lucky to get out of there alive. Can you talk about your experiences in St. Lo? Uh-huh. Because you guys were fighting from, from hedgerow to hedgerow? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Oh, yeah. The, 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 but everybody's scared. But Some, when, you were, when you were in St. Lo, what was your daily life like? How, how much were you guys advancing day to day? Well, well every day you did, 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 did. we're going to take the, this place at, at, at all costs and that, that, that will object it. And then the next day, the same, the same routine again. A lot of guys would shoot themselves on the leg there so they get out of, the, out of combat. And then Budo, they get hell on there. Why don't you shoot yourself in the head, you coward? That's what the doctor would tell him when I was in the hospital. Did you guys have to um, cross any minefields? Oh, yeah. They got the ones that he, 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 they call it the bounce. If you step on it, it would bounce out and throw some steel. If you have wounded, it will kill you. Is that the, the bouncing Betty? Yeah, they call it the bouncing Betty. And then they had one that screamed like, oh, I, I thought the, the world was coming to an end. Oh, I could hear, what the hell is that? He says, that's a screaming Mimi. I thought the world was coming to death to break her morale. And, and it did, it, 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 and it worked. I was, I was real scared when I heard that damn thing. The noise of it. Yeah. Put you on edge. Yeah. And what would you do to keep your your uh, to keep motivated? Is there anything that you would do or tell well, yourself? Or well, the only thing uh, to keep you the way is they firing and they shoot, just hoping not to get killed. But you say I'm gonna be next. I'm gonna be next. I think one of next people. I'm going to be next. And you, uh, you said earlier, somebody told you there's only two types of soldiers. Yeah. They said the dead and the wife are going to die. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty grim, huh? Yeah. But uh, everybody's scared. And don't, don't let nobody tell you. You know, that noise is from artillery, machine guns, and tanks, whatever they throw at you. The artillery, the one that you can hear is that it's going to be away. The one that you don't hear is the one that's going to land close to you. But if artillery lands, it can blow the whole house away. Were you afraid of dying? Well, hell yeah, everybody's afraid. But there's, not, there's nothing you, you can do. Do you feel lucky that you made it home alive? Right, yeah. It, like, it, like I tell you, the only one that can save you is the good Lord. Yeah. Are you a religious man? Ah, oh, Catholic. Yeah. Did, you, did you pray? Oh, yeah, oh, you pray. <laughs> That's all you do, pray. Oh, I'm going to be next. Help me, God. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do this. I wasn't a real bad alcoholic. So you made, you made uh, promises when you yeah, combat. And I broke them, yeah. Well. So he's the one that's going to punish me. You guys, I'm 
soon you'd be sleeping in foxholes and Oh yeah. Did you ever find any homes or houses, or were there any any French citizens that ever took you guys in? Ah, uh, no. Well, uh, once in a while, uh, you could see uh, probably people hanging out under a bridge or something, because there's a lot of bombing and, art, and besides the bombing, the artillery and all the stuff, the planes, and when the the planes go on a strafe, you will they make a lot of noise. And, and you're lucky that you don't get hit. Right there, the only thing that can help you is the good Lord, no, nobody else. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And what weapons did you carry on you? The M1. And we had a little rocket for ten. It, it, it barely go from here, to, not even from here to cross the street. The Germans had some good ones. They went to go from across the street and hit a tank, knock, knock some of our tanks off. And they had good armory. It was the one thing about them. You mentioned earlier um, when you had captured the uh, the German soldier at night, and you received your your bronze star for that. Had you encountered any other uh, German soldiers before or after that? No. No, just the, the the ones that were dead there, and and boy, do they stink too. Were you by yourself when you had captured him? Yeah, when I went to the, I went to the German line, I was by myself. Can you take me through that experience? Well, I, I, I was there and we retreated, they, they called it a strategic withdrawal in the night, and they said, go check up to the, the front lines. So I, went, I was walking there and I saw this German over there, handy hole, and dropped the arms. March, march, that means start walking. So I took him over there, that's when they gave me that brown star. Uh, I didn't know the, the, the ones that, probably one of the company commanders, say gave him the brown star or gave him the silver star. I didn't know that I had it coming. So you had fought your all your way all the way through France and into Germany. Yeah. Correct. Did you guys cross the the Siegfried line? Yeah. And they, uh, Did you run into resistance there? Uh, no, there was uh, one. When I got hurt, uh, they, there was one of, the, one of the bunkers there on the street line. Uh, there was a doctor there and put me, gave me another shot. He said, you're, you're all make, messed up. You're going to go back to the States, he told me. When did you when did you earn your silver star? Oh, Where was that? Uh, was that in France? Yeah, I, I, I was there. Uh, you remember which town you were in? I think I was at uh, Saint Lo. And they say I've been here every day, attack and attack, and I'm gonna, and I'm going to get killed. So there was a bike there, and I rode. I got on the bike and went to the German lines. That's when they took off. <laughs> we got our objective, but we 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 were there since at dawn, and we we, we couldn't advance. So, so when I went out there, they gave me that silver star. I said, I, if I'm going to get killed, it might as well be right now. Let's go. Now, what led you to that decision? 
Well, I just, I was tired of the, the same routine every day, attack and attack. Like, like a guy say, attack and attack, and now none of us called back. So I said, if I'm going to get, get killed, I might as well be right now. Because I cannot survive all these bullets and crap that you throw at you. Did that, did that become too much? Uh... Yeah. Too much for you to, to, to deal with? Yeah. Just, just like the guy who could go shoot those pills on the foot or something. And then the guys that don't get hold of the weed. Let's go to the front line. Oh no! <laughs> so you better run that loose. Did you ever think about shooting yourself in the foot? Nope. Instead, you, you jumped on a bike and, and headed for the German front line. Yeah, I, no, no, I never thought. So no, they I weren't. Were they firing at you while you were riding your bike? Uh, I, I, they had me wide open, but I, I, I don't know what made them take off. So that, they took, so we were there all morning and we couldn't advance. So I said, I'm, I'm going to get killed anyway, so my life will be right now. So I got on the bike and went towards them and then they took off. So we got our objective. And I, I didn't know when I'd go to the hospital. I saw a silver star there. How many, how many uh, Germans were you headed towards? Oh, I don't know. There's so damn many. You can hear them talk at night. You can hear them talk. But when you were on your bike and you were riding towards them, how, oh, many, how oh, many did you see? Uh, well, it, it was kind of far, but they were, they were, we were there all morning. We couldn't advance. Probably a block, a block, a block away. Well, well, you could hear them, their machine guns. So they, I don't know what happened that they took off. Did you see them retreat? No, no. All, all I saw that they just they stopped firing, and, and we, we we went over there. They had their they had their foxholes there. Because they have, the, the, the ones that are on the offensive, that, 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 that's their, they got a bear idea because they, you're going wide open and, and then they run their foxholes. But were you, were you firing at them while you were riding your bike or? No, because no, I, I was, I had my rifle here and, and, and ride my, the bike. And at what point did you turn around and return to? Your, uh, and I don't know, we met with the rest of the soldiers there and, and we got, uh, every day we're going to take uh, this place at, at all costs. Once you get your, your, your objective, you're done there. So I, I was happy that they didn't kill me because I was wide open with the bike like this and my rifle here. And, and like I tell you, the good Lord the one to save you, and nobody else. What did What did your buddies say to you once that Once that happened, did you guys Did they ask you how, what you were doing? And no, I, I, I didn't. You didn't think you were crazy for jumping on a bike and? <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't even even know it by myself. I said. Well, uh, I said, I, I've been here too damn long I mean, and I'm going to get killed, so I might as well be right now, so I, I just took off on the bike. Did you ever have any regrets about joining the Army? No. No, I'm very proud. I'm proud that I fought for this country. And then, uh, can you take me through the day and when you were wounded? Was it October 19th, 
Uh, well, I was there in a uh, foxhole, and um, yeah, a little water, and I hadn't uh, taken a shot. I had a, I had an uh, air cool. Uh, I put some wigs. So, uh, the dense forest is very heavy with brush, and, and water was running down, and there was stream of water. So I, I took up shower there were my best way. Good thing, I, uh, when I got in the hospital, at least I was clean. I wasn't full of mud and dirt that let, when you're in a foxhole. We were holding the line there. Sometimes the Germans would come and capture some of our soldiers and take them with them. It was so thick. The dense forest is real thick. You can hardly walk through all the brush. But they knew we were there, that's why they were bombarding us. There's artillery that flows in the air, and, and there's the one that hits. The one that hits there can knock you whole and everything. They'll blow you away, even your dog tags. You got hit by one of them. Yeah. You've got to be real lucky to get out of there alive. Like I tell you, the only one that, that can save you is the good Lord. And where were you wounded? In your leg? Uh, yeah, I still got flattened over there, and I had a broken arm. And I was bleeding to death where, when this par paramedics came and were tying my leg and gave me a shot. Come the pain was hot. I was yelling, it was uh, that hot iron there was, and you could feel the blood going out. Did you think that was the end for you? Yeah, and, and then I had this broken arm. I didn't know for, that my arm was broken. Only this was the, the hot iron that was the one that make, made me yell. How long were you laying there for until the medic got to you? Uh, uh, no. Probably about 20 minutes, and I gave him credit for going there where the, the artillery was. You, you want to smoke? I never did smoke. No, just get the hell out of me before I get another hit, I told him. So they put me in one house and took me to a German pill box. So he, he stopped the bleeding, yeah. gave, you, gave you morphine, and he, pulled you out of the, yeah, out of the but, forest. Then the doctor went over there and gave me another shot. He said, you were, you were pretty well fucked up. You're going to go back to the States, he said. Oh, thanks to God, I told him. And I was in the hospital in Paris when they had that battle of the bulge. How long were you in that pillbox for until you were evacuated? Uh, not very much. Then they put us in a train to Paris, at the hospital in Paris. Were you there for a day or a few hours? I, 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 in Paris, I stayed uh, overnight, and from there they back to England again. But before, um, before you arrived in Paris, when you after you'd gotten wounded and you were you were pulled into that that German pillbox, how long did you stay there until they evacuated? Uh, not very long, probably but four hours. Were there other soldiers in there as well who had been wounded? Oh, yeah. And then we went to the hospital in Paris. That's when we heard that they had went a hundred miles, the Germans on the Battle of the Walsh. That's when I was in the hospital in Paris. And I said, I hope they don't come. And I can't move and do a damn thing for myself. You thought but, they might make their way all the way back to Paris? So uh, I said, uh, uh, I can't move nor nothing. I, I couldn't move because all, all this. Is. So I went back to England. And, and when I was in England, I, I was, uh, had the open wound over here. 
and I, and the nurse said, well, I don't know where she went, so I, with one leg I crawled and went to the shower. Ooh, the I got an infection there. Your leg got infected? Yeah. Was there any, uh, any danger of having to amputate? Well, I was scared of that. And, and even when I got this charge, I would go to Long Beach Hospital there. You, are you, you coming back over here, Martinez, again? Yeah. So I put me a little piece of a tube there and gave me some more shots. So how long were you in England before uh, you, were, you were sent back to the States? Uh, let me see. Probably about six months, because I saw a guy that used to be a, a engineer on, on, on the CC camp, and uh, he saw me there and said, what are you doing, Martinez? <laughs> well, I'm going, there, I'm going home, I told him. And he, he, he was a captain, but he was an engineer, Mr. Boots. He was coming on the ship. This says you left. You left England, uh, January 1945. I, who did I get sick when I get on that ship? My stomach would get upset, like a hangover. You got seasick again on the way back. Yeah. Yeah. How, how long was it until you were able to walk again? Uh, uh, Probably about a month, so I, 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 I could walk with a walker and so on. But I still got out of shrapnel on my right leg there. He looks like a hamburger the way he looks on the x-ray. How did it feel to be back home out of combat. Well, it feels good. Did you feel bad having to leave uh, your buddies on the battlefield? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I miss all that. Because uh, you're you, you used to being there with the whole gang. Especially one that Paul Pavalka, he used to be next to me all the time. He was a, a real Catholic. He would ask, what are we going to do, Ernie? Paul, there's nothing we can do. If we're we going to die, it's up to the men upstairs. That's all we can do. And, and poor guy, he just gets, he got a nerve attack. He just lay there like this, shaking. So after you'd returned home and you, you uh, received your discharge, was it difficult for you to return to civilian life? Well, uh, when I got out, I was a real bad alcoholic. I said I could have no school, no nothing, and what the hell am I, 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 I was in Calvados and her hospital and in, uh, close to Calexico in that place over there. So I stayed there. I had a little money that I had saved. I stayed there drinking till I finally came to go to California here in Los Angeles. Did you suffer from uh, PTSD from your experiences? Yeah. I can't sleep. I still got to take me a sleeping pill. You still deal with that today? Yeah. They got me 100% disabled. Mm -hmm. So they gave me a good pension. Have you just recently started talking about your experiences during the war? Uh, I don't hardly talk unless somebody asks me something. Like you or... Do you find that that, that helps? Well, 
I never forget it. That's why I have a hell of a time sleeping. I close my eyes and picture all the dead soldiers and on the battlefield. Hundreds of dead soldiers, blood. If there was anything that you could say to those soldiers that didn't make it back home, what would you say to them? I gave them, they're the real, they're the, they're the, they're the real heroes. Because they paid with their life. I lost an arm and leg. So you eventually overcame uh, heavily drinking and, and... Yeah, I haven't drank for years. But, but, but I'm nervous as hell. Anything like I'm jumpy. And you attribute that to uh, a way of coping with your, um, yeah. with your service history. Sometimes, you know, when my phone will be ring. <laughs> well, what did you do for work after, um, after you got out of the service? Well, I started working different places and till I went and with a VA and uh, I learned to fix those machines, to make police equipment, the saddles and all that crap. I learned to re repair all those machines. I, I, I would get me a job doing that in you know, any town. You know, they wouldn't pay me, at that time they wouldn't pay much. Is there anything from uh, your time overseas that we haven't talked about that you'd like to uh, you'd like to share? <laughs> Not my, I, w I went to uh, without a pass to a city named Swansea, and as soon as I got to, to Swansea, that was the empty. Where your pass soldier? I think I forgot it. Uh, 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 come on, let's go see the captain. I see the fucking captain every day. Why did you leave? I decided to go over here. You don't decide. We decide for you. You go and do some extra duty. I was used to, to that. Because they would never give me a pass. Not even when I was training here, they wouldn't give me a pass. Well, I was an asshole. Did you ever face any discrimination? No. Oh yeah, when I got to Pomona one day, we were in a restaurant. I had my uniform with me and another guy that I knew. We were there and they wanted to serve us. And what happened? So the waitress would go and tell the cook, I'm, what you guys want to eat? So I, I told him what we wanted to eat, so he served us. But in my time, when you go to El Paso, it says no black or Mexicans allowed. They put on the restaurant. Probably not a good feeling uh, after you served your country and then turn home and see those sorts of things. Oh, yeah. So if there's any advice that you could offer for my generation, future generations, what would you be able to, to share? Well, there's a lot of opportunities if you, if you want to go to school or college, whatever. They can do it, but, but in the time that I was born, there was no, didn't have no clothes, no, 
sometimes nothing to eat, barefooted. No refrigeration, eating rotten beans and water with bugs. I guess, I guess the good Lord <laughs> help me with that. He had a plan for you. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd, you'd like people to know about you? No, there's not much anymore that I know. All I, that I'm lucky to be alive, fear it. If you could do it over again, would you? Well, I, I guess I, I would have to. And I'm a very proud that I fought for this country. Well, I want to thank you very much for sitting down and speaking with me today. Okay, thank you.